Hello, and welcome. My name is Ken Thompson, and I am lay member of the Marshfield United Methodist Church. This congregation, aided by the connection with all of the United Methodist Churches in the conference, makes these talks possible. I pray that these talks are worthy of their generosity and that they encourage you and me to strive for a deeper relationship with God, transforming us into better disciples of Jesus Christ. As I prepared the next two episodes, I was pondering and studying, praying for insight into the resurrection of Jesus, the reason we celebrate Easter. Obviously, I was not an eyewitness to the events which took place on that Easter morning. As with so much of the Christian story, we have to rely initially on the testimony of those who were witnesses and to those whom they told and wrote it down. Then, with the addition of faith, you and I can begin to understand the miracle of Easter. In first century Judaism, no proposition in court could be proved without the testimony of two witnesses. Women were not considered reliable enough to be witnesses in most instances. But when God performed the greatest miracle in history, the defeat of sin and death, the gift of undeserved purity and God's eternal presence available to all who would trust and follow him, when God raised Jesus from the dead, when God revealed this miracle to the court of free choice, whom did he choose for the very first witnesses? Women. Women deemed unreliable by their culture. Women are the witnesses God chose. And even more, God directed these women to testify to what they had just witnessed, what they had seen and heard to the rest of Jesus' followers, who were hiding out in another woman's upper room in Jerusalem. Upon obeying God's direction, these Easter women became the first apostles of Christianity, the very first people responding to God's call as witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. Well, who were these women? What were they doing at the tomb of Jesus? Why were people who were considered unreliable by their culture chosen by God to make the initial announcement of the resurrection? And why would the writers of all four Gospels canonize into our Bible, as well as many others whose writings were not included in our Bible, tell the part about women being the first witnesses? I mean, if they were interested in selling their religion to the rest of the world. During this talk and the next, I'd like to consider these questions. So, Let's begin with what Scripture tells us. To help with that, I have prepared a chart with information which I have extracted from the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, beginning with Mark, which most scholars believe to have been the first of the Gospels written, and ending with John, which the same scholars have concluded was the last of the four written. The left column on the chart lists the gospel name with the scriptural citations, then the people described in that gospel as being present on Easter morning at the empty tomb. The right column does the same for the crucifixion plus those who were at, who were at the tomb when the body of Jesus was placed inside. You might want to pause the video for a couple of minutes to look over the chart, but notice that the accounts are different, not necessarily contradictory but not alike. The truth is the same in all four Gospels. The tomb of Jesus was empty. God had raised Jesus from the dead just as Jesus had forewarned them. The women then understood the meaning of what Jesus had told them, and the Easter women obeyed God's direction and rushed to testify to that truth to some of the other disciples. Exactly who were these women who witnessed the empty tomb? The ones I've called the Easter women. Well, it's difficult to know. Their names are not completely helpful, for in the first century in Judah, one-fourth of all the Jewish women were named Mary, or Miriam, the transliteration into Greek or Latin from the Aramaic or Hebrew. Secondly, 
throughout the history of Christianity, the identity and character of some of these women have changed in order to better suit the popular orthodoxy of that age. In that process, some of these women have even morphed into one another. Skipping Mary Magdalene until episode two, let's start with Joanna. Named only by Luke, in Luke chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, the author tells us that Jesus traveled through Galilee with his 12 male disciples and some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases or infirmities. And these women supported the expense of the ministry of Jesus out of their own funds. Among these women was Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the chief steward of the household of Herod. For some background information, Chusa was the chief financial officer and administrator of Herod Antipas, the Tetrarch of Galilee. This Herod was the grandson of Herod the Great, who was the king of all of Palestine when Jesus was born. Herod Antipas was called a Tetrarch because his realm, Galilee, was only one-fourth of the size of the kingdom ruled by Herod the Great. Of course, both Herods served at the will of the Roman emperor. Herod Antipas is the one who allowed his wife to trick him into murdering John the Baptist. Chusa, as head of Herod's household, would have had the opportunity to acquire legitimately, more or less, much wealth. So Joanna, his wife, would have had access to the best medical advice and treatment available in all the Roman Empire. Evidently, her infirmity remained acute until she sought and obtained a cure from Jesus. In the first century, many Jewish people believed that illness was caused by evil spirits, vestiges left over from sin by the sick person, or maybe even by their ancestors. Whether by his touch or by exorcism, Jesus cured Joanna. In grateful response, Joanna followed Jesus and personally financed much of his traveling ministry, including the necessities of those who traveled with him. In such a regard, Joanna would have worked closely with Judas, her male counterpart, as treasurer. Joanna put her treasure where her heart was. Jesus had made her whole, and she gave him her all. While Judas betrayed, Joanna believed. According to Luke on Easter morning, she was told by two angels that Jesus had been raised and she was among the first to testify to this truth to the eleven disciples and the others in the upper room. Joanna, one of the Easter women. In listing these Easter women, only the Gospel of Mark refers to Salome. Matthew is the only gospel which refers to the mothers of the sons of Zebedee, and John is the only gospel which refers to Mary, the mother of Jesus, having a sister who was present at the crucifixion, whose name may also have been Mary, and who may have been the same as Mary of Clopas, or the same as Mary, the mother of James, or James the younger or lesser, or Joseph, or Joseph, or Mary Salome, so many Marys. Before separating the Marys one from the other or joining a couple of them as one and the same person, I need to mention a complication or maybe a sorting criteria. The Roman Catholic Church, among others, believes in the perpetual virginity of Mary, the mother of Jesus. That is, she had no children after Jesus so that when Mark 6.3 lists the brothers of Jesus, James, Joseph, Jude, and Simon or Simeon, he really means close family members. The scholars of the Catholic Church claim the Greek word adelphoi, translated as brothers in many versions of the Bible, really means close family members, such as first cousins or nephews. Generally, most Protestant denominations have no argument with the translation of the word as brothers. No one knows for sure, but the great weight of scholarship believes that Salome is Mary Salome, the mother of the sons of Zebedee, James and John, two of the disciples of Jesus. Roman Catholics believe that it, that is possible, and most Protestant denominations hold that it's probable. 
believing that Mary Salome is the sister or half-sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And according to the King James Version of the Bible in Mark 15, 41, was one of the women who came up from Galilee and followed Jesus and administered to him throughout his ministry. We do know from the Bible that Jesus called James and John to be his disciples. Their father was Zebedee, also known as Thunder, and when James and John left to follow Jesus, they abandoned their father's multi-boat fishing business. So Zebedee was probably substantially more affluent than most Galileans. We also know that the mother of James and John, while traveling with Jesus, asked Jesus if her sons could sit on the right and the left hand of Jesus when he came into his glory. Well, even if short-sighted, that request does seem to be a little less outrageous if it was from a beloved aunt talking to her favorite nephew. We also have a hint as to where Mary Salome got the assets to assist Jesus and his entourage in their mission. Yep, from good old thundering Zebedee and his fishing business. Not to the most difficult identity. Again, let me emphasize, no one is absolutely sure of the identity of Mary, the mother of James and Josie's common Jewish names, or Mary of Clopas, and whether of means daughter of or wife of. It's my understanding that most biblical scholars believe that Mary, the mother of James the Younger and Josie's, named in Mark, and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, named in Matthew and Luke, and Mary of Clopas, named in John, are all one and the same person. The traditional view of the church, at least since the time of Jerome, writing in the late 4th century, was that Mary, the mother of Jesus, remained a virgin all her life, and that those named as brothers of Jesus in Mark and Matthew were in fact his close relatives, first cousins actually, the children of Mary, the wife of Clopas, who was the brother of Joseph, the husband of Mary, the mother of Jesus. More modern variations on the theme of Jerome are that Joseph was married before he married the Virgin Mary, and before his first wife died, they had a daughter who, of course, was named Mary. This daughter married Clopas and had the children listed as Adelphoi of Jesus in the Gospels. In this theory, the close relatives would have been half-nephews of Jesus and step-grandchildren of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Other theories as to identifying and separating the Marys have been proposed over the years. Some believe that the Mary, mother of James and Josie's, refers to the Virgin Mary herself. But it strikes me as more than curious as to why the authors of the Gospel would refer to the mother of Jesus by identifying some of her other children. Of course, that theory is unacceptable to the Roman Catholic Church. Others claim that Mary of Clopas is the Virgin Mary's half-sister and Mary Salome's sister or half-sister. Too many Marys. Too complicated. So many unknowns. You would think identifying Mary Magdalene would be much easier. Well, that story is for the next episode. But let me talk just a bit about what I'm able to make out from the people at the cross, from those at the tomb at burial, and from the women, whoever they were, at the empty tomb on that Easter morning. What truths do I find in the Easter women? Often, the relationship between Jesus and his family is depicted as estranged. There are verses in the Bible which might be interpreted in such a way as to indicate that. But I would argue that those passages are almost always about priorities and not about a denial of the importance of family. Sometimes, because our relationship with Jesus today is one of us as humans relating to the divine, we overlook the humanity of Jesus while he was on earth. Then it's easy to understate how much Jesus suffered and how much joy he felt in being alive. The folks at the cross and at the tomb were his family and friends. He loved them, of course, 
but they also loved him and filled his life with the joy and pain which always comes with loving family and loving friends. Maybe I'm prejudiced by my own experience, but when you grow up in an area surrounded by extended family and close friends, the exact degree of kinship makes very little difference in how much you love each other and has absolutely nothing to do with how angry you become if one of your family or friends is being mistreated or how much you suffer when a family member or friend is in pain or how much you grieve when one has died. I believe that the presence of his convoluted but constant family and friends at his death and at the tomb demonstrate that far from an estrangement, Jesus the human was surrounded by the people who loved him, doing what family and friends do, rallying as best they could in his time of need. Yes, some were missing, and no, the pain they felt was nothing compared to what Jesus was experiencing. But these people loved this man. They were suffering, and on Easter morning, these suffering women were at the tomb to honor their loved one, by anointing his body with spices and perfume. Now, imagine the anguish Jesus the human must have felt in addition to the excruciating physical pain. He was leaving behind those whom he loved so very much, who had brought him such joy through the years, who honored him with their presence at what the world deemed a shameful death. I believe the group of family and close friends at the foot of the cross serves to remind us that Jesus was all human, truly a man of sorrow. Even with his faith and his ultimate exaltation, Jesus was suffering on that cross with an almost unbearable sense of loss, the loss of his family, the loss of his friends, and of his humanity. And these women were there to comfort him as best they could. But suffering isn't the end of the story. Come back with me in episode two of these talks on Easter women. There is so much more to tell. Spoiler alert, he is risen 